from, uh, from the state of Michigan. Uh, last, last but not least, Valeo. Uh, Valeo will uh, present also how they are modifying their uh, working space uh, to adapt to that new reality. So in short, uh, COVID-19 has been a major disruptor yeah, in uh, the way we operate business. With vaccination in place, what will return to normal? What will return to the pre-COVID stage? And what will be altered forever and in to which extent. I will let each of uh, the panelists introduce themselves in more details, introduce their organization. It's now my pleasure uh, to pass uh, the word to uh, Joey Gatley from Colliers International. Thank you, Cedric. And thank you to the French Chamber for hosting this uh, wonderful webinar. Thank you to the fellow panelists for all the work that's gone into it. And uh, we look forward to having a nice discussion, answering any questions, and uh, always here as a resource uh, thereafter. So I'm Joey Gatliff. I'm a vice president at Colliers International based out of Detroit. My practice is focused on assisting corporate occupiers with their global real estate needs. Um, you know, we, we are all living through a very dynamic and changing time. So hopefully the information that we provide here will be more of a starting point for discussion and, and some thoughts that we have as we see it in the industry. So with that being said, Cedric, uh, the first slide, please. A little bit about Colliers and who we are, you know, not spend too much time here, but we help, you know, landlords, investors, um, occupiers or developers and more institutional investors with uh, all these various aspects of the, the real estate and property world. Uh, if you fast forward to the next page, a little bit of data and, and some numbers to give you an idea of the scale. We're very much a global company. We're very entrepreneurial. So when we help our clients uh, in, in each of the locations where we occupy offices, uh, we're very much you know um, entrepreneurial and boutique driven uh, at the service level. <clears throat> Okay, so the way we've organized the presentation is, you know, the past uh, and talk about some of the trends that we saw prior to COVID. Most of you that occupy space in one way or another may, may you know, have your own thoughts. But, you know, at, at the peak around 2009, 2010, you know, there was about 213 square feet per employee being occupied. And that began to kind of, you know, trickle down to about, you know, 190 square, uh, square feet per employee. And that was because of trends in the office world, such as collaborative space, cafes, game rooms, lounges, flexible meeting spaces, getting people closer together as a ways to, you know, incre increase productivity, collaboration, uh, also, you know, uh, as a tool for attraction and, uh, and retention of employees. In the manufacturing uh, space, you know, hybrid working environments, obviously office, and then, you know, mostly production or shop space. Typically, the office component of those, those operations are 10 to 20% of office space as you creep into a high tech or a headquarters R&D environment that would go up to about 30%. So a little more segregated, but uh, definitely obviously co-working still. If you go to the next slide, Cedric. So COVID-19 arrives, what happens? In the office space, you know, offices shut down indefinitely uh, unless employees are deemed essential. And people were still very much, you know, being, uh, you know, flexible as we, as we understood what COVID became. Remote working was quickly adopted. Zoom team meetings, you know, uh, definitely had been used in the past, but not as, as often as, as they, they became needed for in COVID-19. Uh, workplace safety was a concern, obviously having contract trace, contact tracing, all of the, uh, the protocols in place for organizations to be able to operate at whatever capacity they were. And then, you know, really trying to understand the transition to more of a remote working environment as we realized that COVID was here to stay. Manufacturing world responded a little differently because most manufacturers were still deemed essential. So though, although there were shutdowns initially and there was a little bit of a standstill created by many factors, including supply chain in China, um, you know, eventually the manufacturer will picked up a bit quicker. And obviously we saw that, you know, as the year progressed, PPE uh, production, you know, was shifted and you see some of the local companies that, that actually shifted some of their focus from their main industries to PPE production. Um, if you go to the next slide, Cedric, so one of the things that we wanted to put into context is really, uh, you know, how, how was the office being used? And this one chart really kind of gives you a great example. Back in March before COVID really, really struck, you were close to 94, 97% of key cards being swiped at offices across, um, you know, across the, the country. Um, in these in top 10 metros. Now, as you see, you know, it's dramatically goes down and hovers to around 24 to 27%. And, uh, and, and we haven't really seen that tick back up yet. And there's a lot of reasons for that. So we'll, you know, this is a pretty good chart to, 
to give you a, a very quick snapshot. Um, if you go to the next slide, Cedric. And so, you know, the office of the future, how do we predict it? I mean, we're all living it right now, but I think some of the things is remote working and, and, and these kind of, you know, video calls have been very commonplace and employees have learned to adapt, you know, pretty quickly to working in this environment. And there's more of an attitude of quality of work versus quantity. So before it was, you know, kind of first in, you know, last out of the office. Now it's, you know, are you getting your job done? Are you being effective? Are you being productive? And so I think we're still learning all of that, but that's definitely what the focus has, has been as, as we hear it from our clients. Um, as occupiers face upcoming decisions relative to their leases, you know, they're looking to balance the need for a traditional workspace and everything that comes along with that collaboration, branding, um, versus the realities of COVID and, 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 and the needs of, of returning to work and the liabilities of a mandatory return. Interesting points to consider, you know, is less space needed because of more employees working from home or is more space needed because you have to spread out the employees that you have in the office and have more dedicated areas for someone to be you know, really on their own. Um, you know, obviously the market has shifted in favor of tenants to a certain degree. Organizations feel they have more leverage against landlords um, as, as they are faced with those pressures of, of remote working and reducing office occupancy. With that being said, landlords also have the opportunity to become industry leaders and, and creating the workplace of the future. Next slide, please. So in the industrial world, obviously industrial has remained pretty robust. And, you know, if you see, you know, kind of on the, uh, on the right side, the graph shows, you know, new supply has increased, the outlook is bullish. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, e-commerce is, is clearly the big catalyst. So as you see in the bubble down there, you know, every additional billion dollars in online sales creates, you know, over a million square feet of demand um, for, for new warehouse space to fill those orders. Um, occupiers are taking on more space, speculative industry, industrial development is, is robust, vacancy rates are low. Um, you know, the, the questions here are, as you have lease decisions approaching, you know, really the office component of your requirement is what's going to drive, you know, the questions. I mean, do you need to really dramatically reduce that office footprint? Is the building created in a way where the office is just such a large part, or can you peel any of it back? And then obviously how much production or, or, or warehousing space do you need? Um, so, you know, again, definitely a more, you know, robust sector and, and we're very bullish on industrial. Next slide. And, and, and kind of like here, you know, what, what are the action steps as companies kind of imagine their future? You know, we kind of have these three phases that respond, which is, you know, we, we, we feel that we've kind of gotten past that to a certain extent, you know, understanding what, what we, you know, what we were faced with. Now you have a recovery period where you learn and emerge, you know, and see the trends that your, your organization, you know, uh, specifically are, are going through and experiencing and, and how, you know, collect the data of how productivity and, and, uh, and your operations are impacted. And the last is the recovery and the, or I'm sorry, the thriving, you know, component of it where you, you've assessed everything, you've made the plans and now you're prepared to kind of enter this next phase or this new future as, as we call it. Next slide. I guess that's it. And so we, we definitely, you know, I know we wanted to kind of keep things on a schedule here, but, you know, we think there's definitely a lot of clash questions uh, there. It's still an evolving uh, scenario. And, you know, I think that, you know, most importantly, as, as companies understand, you know, how they can safely return to work, um, you know, what they are allowed to do and what they feel comfortable doing and, and how, what the pro productivity has been in a, in a more hybrid, you know, remote working world. That will that will continue to you know craft the dialogue moving forward. And thank Very you. Very good. Sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joey. We are going to move to uh, our next uh, panelist. So, Chris, if you don't mind uh, coming into play, here we go. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I want to thank Cedric and uh, French American Chamber of Commerce for inviting me to speak today specifically on the many steps it's gonna take for all of us to, to have, resume business travel to even a semi-normal level. <clears throat> I'm Chris Conlon, president and owner of Conlon Travel. We're based in Ann Arbor, Michigan uh, and have offices and employees all over the country. We handle uh, mainly corporations that spend anywhere from about a million to 20 million a year. Of course, that's pre-COVID. And we're affiliated with uh, BCD Travel, which is an international uh, agency with locations all around the world that we leverage for our global US-based customers. Uh, next slide, please. There are many steps, uh, and some of these are quite obvious to most of you, uh, that have to occur before a return to business travel 
uh, begins. Uh, this month, almost to the day, all of us were grounded for business travel uh, by air. And it's just statistically, only about 15% of you are presently taking business trips by air. And of that, 99% of that is, is domestic. So we've got to see COVID numbers drop here and abroad, but the really good news is that's happening. U.S. cases are down. They reported 77% uh, this past week and reported daily coronavirus infections have been falling all around the world. Uh, but optimism uh, over, uh, over getting out of this crisis has been somewhat tempered by the new variants we're beginning to hear about, uh, which raises fears about the efficacy of the vaccines. And speaking of vaccines, uh, it needs to, in fact, vaccines need to be widely administered. Again, good news here. A uh, good 46 plus or minus million Americans have been vaccinated, at least with the first shot. Uh, and despite these slowdowns in the distribution that you hear about, looks like we will be approaching uh, that ever, ever herd immunity uh, late spring, maybe even early summer. Uh, another important issue is we all got to get back in the office. Right now, there's hardly anyone to go visit on a business trip, uh, and many of us have not returned to our offices yet. Uh, additionally, uh, company travel policies, uh, which are quite fluid, will need to be updated uh, based on the ever-changing ever environments out there for, for business travel. State and government lockdowns uh, need to be lifted. There's been very little consistency and we are all fully aware of the confusion, different interpretations of the COVID risk factors that are out there and around the world have been interpreted. But all the government entities um, are loosening up their restrictions or at least they're talking about it and announcing plans to do so. A uh, big deal for all of us here on this call is quarantines. Quarantines are they're just a deal breaker for travelers. Uh, and until these are lifted, very few international business trips will occur. Uh, recently, the UK just announced their plans to lift their quarantines and other countries are doing so or will do so soon. Uh, so all the above are dependent on governments and we know how quickly or not governments move. Uh, so it's important to governments that they are moving quicker and we're seeing them moving quicker than ever before to get their economy, their business economies back to where they used to be. Uh, then the last item here is something you may have heard a little bit about, but there hasn't been a lot of chatter about it, and, and that is uh, the digital health passport or digital wellness passport that could, and I emphasize the word could, uh, become commonplace pretty quickly. Uh, next slide. So, so uh, digital health passports are a hot topic right now in the air transport industry. The, the technology is considered to have real potential to help drive the international business travel recovery. Uh, as you know, many countries uh, currently required a COVID-19 test uh, that proves you don't have it, at least within the last 72 hours, and they want that upon arrival, but it is possible that proof of a, of a vaccine will be requested or maybe even required soon. Uh, in the leisure business, uh, some of the cruise lines have just announced proof of vaccine before boarding. Uh, no one else is allowed aboard. So the challenges that programmers and developers uh, have to overcome to create these possible digital health passports are, are daunting. And the concerns that I have and you should have are also pretty serious. It's from a developer side, you know, what databases are they gonna search to verify the flyer information? So when you get your vaccine, will, will, will proof of that vaccine be housed in somewhere and how will programmers find it? Uh, how will they know if it's secure? And so will, will developers be responsible to verify the information that they are accessing is secure? Can they trust the information is accurate? Whose responsibility will it be to verify the accuracy of, of passenger data? And will all airlines and airports and, and countries and governments accept the data as official? I mean, it took years for e-tickets to become commonplace around the world. So just imagine this effort. And then uh, will developers be granted access to such confidential information. Who is the governing body that will allow that country by country? Is it healthcare companies or doctor's offices, pharmacies, hospitals? It's a really big question. Uh, so what should your concerns are? What should they be? And what are my concerns? And my, the first one comes with data security. 
the data has to be so narrowly focused that it's just what's necessary for travel or entry to where you're going. You know, who will make sure that it's up to date and where will it come from? Touched on that earlier, but this might be the honor system. It might be up to the traveler to access their records and update maybe a, an airline profile or maybe even download a personal health app and upload that app with the correct data. And will all airlines and countries accept my data? Everyone has to agree on what will be acceptable proof of health. And then it's got to be easy to use. Uh, this goes with all, almost goes without saying. There, there can't be any struggles at checkpoints. And then the way this is all going, there could be post-COVID-19 uses for digital passports. It's possible your health passport may be necessary to get into a concert or a sporting event, or maybe even admission to the next conference or convention that you attend. So as you can, as you can see on the previous slide, there are several solutions have entered the marketplace, uh, but un and unfortunately it's becoming evident there won't be one single globally recognized solution that could work universally across the entire travel industry beyond. So we've got a lot of work to do on this. So the, the timing here, digital health passports, that, you know, they can certainly be the answer to restarting international business travel, but the full rollout and seamless integration of the technology will really depend largely on you know, the rapid implementation of global standards. And, and that reality is, again, governments may take a long time to put those in place. Uh, next slide, please. Last slide. So, um, you know, the industry responded very quickly uh, a year ago. Probably all of us on this call uh, fly Delta, and you know how quickly and efficiently they responded to the changes in the industry. And, and frankly, in many ways, they set the standards for, for air travel safety. Uh, at, at Conlon Travel, uh, we like to say there are blue skies ahead, and we've helped our corporations get ready for the return to travel with all sorts of data, with topics and the links listed on this slide, uh, just to prepare them for the, let's call it the, the new normal in travel. Uh, now, by nature, I'm an optimist, so I'm getting very excited uh, about returning travel to better levels. Uh, there, I realize there'll be ebbs and flows and two steps forward and one step backwards, but uh, I can see a lot of progress being made in our industry right now, and I'm, I'm getting very excited about it, because personally, I am stir crazy. I cannot wait to get on my next business trip. I never thought I'd say that again, uh, but I feel maybe many of you listening in feel the same way. So uh, progress is being made. We're getting there soon, and uh, hopefully midsummer, fall, we'll start seeing those business trips again. So thank you very much for inviting me today, and hope to see you in the sky soon. Thanks. Chris, thank you so much. I mean, quite a compelling uh, and interesting presentation about uh, returning to travel and uh, some thought provoking uh, about what it will take to get us there. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Colin Travel. We're going to move on to Delta. And uh, Nick, if you don't mind coming up on the screen, uh, I'll give you the word in one well, thank you, Cedric, and thank you to all of you for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, my name is Nick DeMarco. I'm the district sales manager for Delta Airlines based here in the Detroit area. Um, I manage a team of six sales professionals who manage corporate and agency accounts in Michigan, Indiana, and then the metro areas of Toledo, Memphis, and St. Louis. And what I'd like to show you today is, is how Delta is leading a return to travel and moving from the new normal to a new future. So let's go ahead and go to the next, the first slide. At Delta, the safety of our employees and customers is always our number one priority. And from the start of the pandemic, we have put the health and safety of our customers and 75,000 employees first in every decision that we have made, even if it meant a loss of revenue. In June, we launched the Delta Care Standard, which is not only a collection of enhanced policies and practices, but is our commitment to offer safer service and personal care at every point in the journey. Last month, Delta was recognized for our efforts to provide a safer, cleaner, and more flexible experience and was awarded the hospital grade diamond rating from the Airline Passenger Experience Association and Simplify. Next slide, please. So what are the policies and practices that we have implemented? Well, first of all, they encompass every aspect of Delta's operation. We like to say from curb to claim, that is they cover our passengers travel journey from the moment they step inside the airport to the ticket counter through security 
to the gate, to the aircraft, of course, and through to baggage claim. I won't recap all of them here, but I would like to highlight a few unique initiatives that, were, that are key differentiators of the Delta Care standard. Firstly, on board the aircraft, we have implemented a 44-point cleaning checklist, including electrostatic spraying between every flight, and we are empowering employees to hold a flight if the Delta Care standard isn't met. We're now the only U.S. airline to block middle seats and limit onboard capacity by extending our middle seat block through April 30th, so travelers can feel more confident when they fly. We provide care kits, including hand sanitizer at the ticket counter and on board, and we're requiring mandatory masks or face coverings throughout the entire travel journey, including at the airport and on board the aircraft. Our focus on flexibility provides customers with the ability to easily book, change, or cancel plans with peace of mind, including eliminating change fees for travel originating from North America to anywhere in the world. We were the first airline to launch a new dedicated cleanliness organization, reinforcing Delta's commitment to clean and safe practices, and we're also the only airline to add a chief health officer when we hired Dr. Henry Ting away from the Mayo Clinic to lead us in rethinking and reimagining our health and well being approach. Through Delta's partnerships with Lysol and the Mayo Clinic, we are developing breakthrough disinfection solutions to set the gold standard for hygiene and aviation across our airport locations and aircraft in three ways. First, gathering insights on consumers' travel experiences to develop innovative disinfecting solutions. Second, developing protocols for disinfection that will help protect customers against illness causing bacteria and viruses in high traffic areas. And third, deploying Delta Care cards, including EPA approved disinfection products provided by Lysol. And we were, we were one of the first Fortune 100 companies to embark on testing our entire workforce to slow and stop the spread of COVID-19. Next slide, please. Delta is the first U.S. airline to offer COVID-free, quarantine-free flights between the U.S. and Europe, which allow customers to avoid quarantine after testing negative for the virus prior to travel and upon arrival in the Netherlands and Italy. Delta's transatlantic COVID-19 testing programs mean customers who test negative three times do not have to quarantine on arrival. Currently, restrictions permit entry to the Netherlands and Italy for essential travel only, including for business, health and medical, study, research, residency, or other essential purposes. And down there at the bottom, uh, on our web website, delta.com, uh, we have the, uh, the travel requirements map, which helps take the guesswork out of traveling. You can not only see the growing list of COVID tested destinations like Rome and Amsterdam, but as requirements are added, like US bound travelers having to show a negative COVID-19 test when boarding, we're proactively making updates. Next slide, please. Looking ahead, we view cleanliness as a long-term game and there is no goal line. Continuing to innovate to find new ways to clean and sanitize is part of the brand promise that we are making to our customers. For example, we are looking at what we can do using science and technology to develop a quality audit program to ensure that we are providing the safest possible surfaces and air for our people. We're exploring new antiviral and antimicrobial coatings that could provide 30 or even 45 days of kill efficacy on the surfaces of our airports and on our airplanes. We're trialing antimicrobial and antiviral laminates on kiosk, kiosk screens and millwork. We're also looking at antimicrobial lighting and UV wands to sterilize on board the aircraft. And we're testing far UV lights and dry hydrogen peroxide units in our sky clubs to provide even cleaner air. We've deployed 50 ATP monitors across the system, which have historically been used in the healthcare and food preparation industries to test services before and after cleaning. And we'll continue to deepen our partnerships with Lysol, Pharrell, Mayo Clinic, and Emory University so that we can understand through their eyes what it is that we can do to improve. Finally, we're deploying Delta Care standard cleaning ambassadors in airports who will be the ear eyes and ears of our global cleanliness organization. Today, we have over 60 clean ambassadors in the operation, and by spring, we'll have 100 covering 50 airports. Next slide, please. We're also making travel easier with updated tools, access to testing, and prioritize flexibility. As I mentioned, we're continuing to block middle seats and restrict capacity on flights through April 30th. We've rolled out a new interactive tool with the power to search and view quarantine and testing requirements and resources by destination, including COVID-19 testing locations. We'll be deploying in-home testing solutions over the next few weeks to bring easy testing options to our customers, leveraging lessons from Delta's comprehensive employee testing program. 
In addition, Delta Vacations is only offering hotel rooms outside of the United States that have on-site testing for travel through April 30th. As I mentioned earlier, all customers can easily cancel, make changes, or rebook on my trips on Delta.com or in the Fly Delta app at any time before the travel date without a change fee on all tickets, excluding basic economy. And recently, we finalized a partnership with high-speed Wi-Fi provider Viasat with their next-generation satellite technology and took steps to launch the Delta Developed Wi-Fi Access Portal, a user interface that enhances how you interact with Wi-Fi. And finally, Chris mentioned the Health Passport, um, and we are developing uh, our own digital concierge uh, for customers whose destination requires a negative COVID-19 test. Uh, beginning with U.S. entry flights and in partnership with Trust Assure, customers will be able to directly upload and verify their documents at check-in through a new functionality available via Delta channels, such as pre-flight emails uh, and Delta.com. A ready-to-fly screen on mobile devices will indicate the customer has provided a verified COVID test. Next slide, please. So with that, I'd just like to conclude by saying that we are ready for you, and we look forward to you joining us when you're ready to fly. On behalf of the 75,000 employees of Delta Airlines, I would like to thank you for your support. And again, thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Cedric. Excellent. Nick, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, what I take of uh, this, uh, this presentation is that uh, the, the, the care and uh, safety of the passengers at the heart of what Delta does. And you're looking into the future, you're looking into how to enhance and maintain uh, that uh, level of uh, care and safety. So I very much appreciate that. Thank you. We are going to move on uh, to uh, our next uh, speaker, Vladko uh, from uh, Michigan Economic Development Corporation. And Vladko, thank you for joining us, if you don't mind uh, starting by introducing yourself. Fantastic, Cedric. Thank you again for having us and including us in this uh, terrific webinar to be part of the FACC. Um, again, my name is Vladko tamik Bovis. I'm the Investment Promotion Director for the European Market for the MEDC. I've been with the organization for just about 10 years now. And in a prior life, um, I was in management consulting and finance, uh, supporting corporates in Europe and in the US. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so the MEDC um, is a, a state marketing agency, of course, to promote business. Um, our organization works with entrepreneurs, small to medium-sized businesses, and large corporates within the state and also outside of the state to attract them uh, for investment and job creation. And our uh, this pandemic, uh, of course, has impacted everybody severely. And what our commitment to the community and to the state is that is that we will do everything that we can to really enable. Uh, statewide economic uh, prosperity throughout this entire crisis. And what that really means is taking a look at all of our core programs and services that we offer, uh, such as uh, business and community development or access to capital or international export and trade and entrepreneurship, and taking a critical look at them to see what can we uh, adopt, what can we change to support uh, companies to go forward, of course, to pull us uh, through this economic uh, pandemic that's driven by COVID-19. Um, if we go to the next slide, you will see a short or uh, a visually stimulating um, timeline. And these are not executive orders by any means, but these are really all of the key initiatives that our organization did since the pandemic really hit us in March of, of 2020, starting, of course, with the declaration uh, of the uh, emergency order uh, by, by the governor, which forced, of course, small businesses, gyms, and even companies to lock down. And our commitment has been throughout the last year and throughout this year that we will be working with everybody that's affected in this uh, crisis, of course, to help them um, recover and grow uh, at even a faster rate than uh, what we um, have seen in pre-pandemic days. And if you go to the next slide, it's just to give you an idea of Michigan's uh, COVID-19 
uh, numbers. I know there is a lot of uh, confusion when the pandemic, of course, hit um, about, you know, where do we get the correct numbers? Is this going to be a CDC uh, item or do we rely on hospitals? Um, how does the state report the numbers? Um, what, what I can say is that, um, and this graph here is, of course, a little bit too small for everybody to see, is that, you know, we are working uh, in, in real alignment at this point with our health systems, with uh, the state of Michigan, of course, and the federal entities to have real results and to be able to track these numbers as accurately as possible. And um, as we kind of go through this timeline here, starting in March, you will, of course, see that upswing in the fall of 2020 when some travel, of course, started for the holiday season. And uh, that's when we started to see some of those spikes again. But as we go to the next slide, what's really encouraging to me is the positivity rate of COVID-19 has dropped below 3%. And which to, to all of us is a key indicator that we are uh, probably through the worst part of this pandemic. And as we uh, move into the, the vaccination phase and the distribution of the vaccine, we hope, of course, to keep this number um, below that 3% threshold and to drive it down even further in an effort to create uh, herd immunity, of course, and then to uh, really look at our business community uh, going forward and see what type of model will be utilized going forward. So in this entire uh, well, pandemic since March 2020, um, our organization has really impacted the entire state. And if you uh, take a look at the following slide, is that we have worked uh, in 83 out of the 83 counties with several businesses to support them, to, uh, to assure that companies have proper protocols in place to have information available to them. And all of these efforts ultimately led to the retention of 200,000 uh, jobs, which um, as we look at is, is, is a driving and a key measure uh, for success in this process. Um, our three uh, pillars that we have really focused on um, throughout this pandemic, um, how, do we, how do we work with businesses in a pandemic in a digital age uh, where contact isn't of course possible? Um, we have focused on three primary pil pillars here. And uh, on the next slide, you will see uh, what, uh, what our initiatives have been. And first, it has been, of course, the increasing the availability of, of PPE for uh, companies, for uh, local and small businesses. And we have created a digital uh, COVID-19 procurement platform where companies can register at no cost. They can source uh, PPE uh, quite quite uh, readily and easily. We have also created several um, grant programs that allow companies to retool and repurpose their operations to meet a changing demand um, as the impact um, has widened. And then lastly, we have made sure that uh, capital has become um, accessible and much easier for businesses, either through uh, loans or even direct grants, um, of course, um, through, through that initiative. And on the next slide is just a brief example of uh, Detroit City, uh, City Distillery, who we have partnered with last year that, of course, pivoted in the uh, production um, of hand sanitizer for frontline workers. And uh, Cedric, if we could move to the next slide. Um, it, that is just one example of, of several companies that we have partnered with to make sure we're creating um, impactful change that also has a win-win situation. Another example is on the next slide with uh, Gene Makers, which was able to uh, provide uh, testing services uh, in downtown Kalamazoo with rapid test kits that uh, that was really needed in June and July of next year. So uh, as the theme of this uh, webinar really is, how do we move forward? You know, what, what's next for 
uh, the MEDC, what's next for our state from a business ecosystem perspective? Well, I can tell you with the, uh, that, with the vaccines being rolled out and hopefully um, uh, people are, of course, are, are getting uh, vaccinated or at least signed up to be vaccinated, we expect that infection rate to stay well below 3% to even dip further down. And then um, on the next slide, you will see that our projected corporate investment uh, in capital expenditures for uh, the, for 2020 and 2021 has is, has risen just above five billion dollars. This, of course, uh, we anticipate will create uh, 13,000 new jobs in, in a variety of of industries, including automotive, of course, mobility, uh, healthcare, and professional services. Now. The, the model, uh, of course, uh, will be different. We don't expect this to be an on and off switch. Of course, now COVID is solved, now everybody goes back to work. What we uh, really envision is uh, to be some type of hybrid model, uh, kind of like Joe has talked about at the, uh, at the first part of this webinar, where it will be some portion uh, with commercial will continue to operate from home, while others slowly dial back the presence uh, in an office setting. Um, for us as an organization, on the next slide, we have four critical pillars that we will focus on um, in terms of a rebooting or restarting the economy to support uh, economic growth. And first, it will be to really look at our toolkit, take a look at our uh, services and programs that we offer not just for existing businesses to grow or to expand, but also take a look at uh, companies. How, do, how can we support them in innovative ways if they have to export to a different market? If, uh, if they need management consulting, if they need access to capital, we were committed to taking a look at all of our programs, our services, all of our incentive tools, and to be very critical of them to make sure they fit the needs of all uh, existing businesses, and of course, attracting new investment into the state. The second pillar that we will really strongly focus on is broadband and the accessibility of internet access and the existing infrastructure at home. Um, as mentioned earlier, we don't envision this working from home uh, to fully go away. It will be a hybrid model for the next two, possibly even three years. And we need to make sure that the infrastructure is really uh, there, it's reliable, it can handle all of these Zoom calls that we're all on to move forward. Thirdly, we will continue to focus on our tourism brand with the popular Pure Michigan brand to really drive tourism in the state. We have the Great Lakes and we have uh, all of the assets that come with that that will continue to be promoted, not just nationally, but uh, internationally to different markets. And then lastly, our commitment to small business support does not go away. We will continue to emphasize small business support, uh, including restaurants, including uh, rural areas to assure that we have equitable um, growth and support for all of the uh, unique and growing businesses in the state. And then lastly, uh, I'll close with uh, you know, access to federal resources that was announced, of course, through the CARES Act. And then on the next slide, you can see um, that the MEDC has formed a federal response team. We can, of course, assist companies and guide them through the complexities uh, of that. And uh, I'm just being nice when it comes to that, but uh, we have a team that's dedicated to support you. So uh, please visit michiganbusiness.org slash COVID-19 or michigan.gov slash coronavirus for up-to-date um, information, or if you'd like to have more uh, direct feedback, feel free to contact uh, me and my colleagues, and we'd be delighted to help you out. So with that, Cedric, I'll turn it back to you. Excellent. So thank you so much, Vladko. I think here it's uh, it's quite interesting uh, to, to realize how much the state of Michigan has been there to support local businesses as they were 
are coping and facing uh, the, the, the aftermath of the, the, the implication of the pandemic. But it's also quite interesting to see how you're adapting to the new future. Uh, we talked earlier on about uh, the, the usage of uh, office space. Well, uh, staying at home or working from home requires infrastructure. And you touched on it, and, and I really appreciate that. So thank you again. Uh, uh, we are moving on to our uh, last panelist uh, for the day. And uh, Corinne, if you don't mind opening your screen, here we go. So thank you very much for joining. Um, I'll let you introduce yourself. Good afternoon. Thank you, Cedric. Thank you, French American Chamber of Commerce. And thank you all for joining. Uh, first, I will introduce myself. I'm Corinne Diemert, uh, HR Director for Valio North America. Uh, I've worked in the automotive my entire career. Uh, I've been with Valio over 30 years, um, not always uh, with HR. So uh, that's a little bit about me. Uh, next slide, please, Cedric. Uh, a little bit about Valio for anyone who doesn't know uh, who we are. Uh, Valio is a global automotive supplier. We're a tech company focused on supplying products and uh, systems that uh, contribute to the reduction of CO2 emissions and uh, intuitive driving. So. We operate in uh, 33 countries, and in North America, we employ uh, approximately 17,000 uh, team members. So uh, almost a year ago, the automotive industry was disrupted overnight. The pandemic has had dis devastating effects on, on, on people's lives. But really, what has come out of this terrible event has been a learning experience. Uh, we gained so much, um, we learned so much in terms of how we're working, um, how to keep our teams safe, how resilient our teams in the industry is, how we work with our teams and how we can use technology to work differently. So I'm gonna take a few minutes just to outline a few of the key elements that we feel or I feel will continue to evolve in our post COVID world. So first, in terms of the safety of our employees, we've implemented strict, sa strict safety policies and protocols at all of our sites to keep our team members safe. And I think this heightened sense, uh, this heightened awareness for safety will continue uh, in the cleanliness of our work environments and also in respecting the personal space so that we can avoid the spread of germs. So this is one thing that, you know, I think we will continue uh, well past uh, once, once COVID is, is over. Um, we're also learning how to effectively manage remote team members. Prior to COVID, you know, we were talking about workplace flexibility, but it really wasn't mainstream um, at Valio. So, um, as we're now, many of us uh, still working remotely, we're learning the importance of transparency and communication with our teams, um, the need for managers to be able to trust um, their remote team members. Um, and that's linked with coaching our managers on how to effectively manage remote teams. Um, we realize the benefits uh, for our team members and, and for our company uh, in this flexible work environment. So we need to be sure that our teams understand how to work efficiently with this model. Um, because I believe in the future, if companies do not continue, we're talking post COVID in years to come, if they don't continue to offer a flexible work environment where possible, um, I think they're gonna have a tough time you know, securing and retaining the needed talent. I think there's gonna be an expectation for employees uh, to be able to work remotely um, where that option exists. So next slide, Cedric. Not only are we learning to manage our teams remotely, but we're learning how to stay connected with the network, with the industry, with our customers in this virtual world. Um, so like today's events, uh, conferences, business meeting, tech events have been replaced with the Zoom calls and, and Google chats. And, and this whole experience is teaching us um, how we can accomplish many things virtually, more than we ever thought were possible. We're doing audits, we're doing um, inspections, presenting new technology to our customers and attending industry events all from our home offices. And who would have thought we'd be able to do all of that? Um, so we're seeing benefits from this. 
Okay, obviously our, our travel budgets. Um, these virtual events give you an opportunity to um, gain access to a broader audience. Um, the events themselves can be less costly to, to host because you don't need a large hall to gather the people. And another benefit that we're seeing um, with our global teams, when you have all of your global teams um, participating virtually, um, normally on video, um, they're really, we're getting an equal participation where it used to be, you know, you'd have your central team around the table and you'd have a few people from around the globe calling in, but you didn't have that even balance. So really now our entire global team is really on a, on a, on a level playing field um, and then truly acting in a global sense. Um, all that being said, uh, Chris and Nick will be happy to hear that I don't think that the virtual world uh, will replace totally the need for, for personal connection. Um, we still uh, see the benefit of sitting face to face to build relationships um, with our customers, with our global teams and in our networks. So I think business travel will, um, I think business travel will um, continue, will be prioritized for, um, it will be prioritized for those personal connections. Uh, I think business, um, next slide please. So I mentioned um, the, ex the expected change in how we manage our teams and our future flexibility. That being said, we have a strong desire to bring our teams back together for collaboration, for employee uh, morale. We just, we, we really do see the need to be back in the office. At Valio, we're still investigating what this hybrid model will look like uh, in terms of balancing remote work um, and office time. Um, we're gathering our team feedback through surveys. We're actually doing another survey now to see if the feedback has changed from early in this remote work um, scenario. Um, so, you know, maybe some things that they appreciated at first are no longer appreciated. So along with how this hybrid work model, it's how will our office, um, you know, how will our offices need to adapt? So we're looking at ways to transform our offices to encourage more collaboration uh, and where we have workspaces that are not, um, you know, that are two old team members or two, two for team members that are not 100% in the office, um, looking at how we can optimize our office space uh, and save our overheads. We're looking at some hotel hoteling concepts um, for when we're all back, um, coming back to the office. Um, like I said, we're not exactly sure how that long term remote work how office will look um, but we're taking our employees feedback to make sure that uh, that it fits well uh, with the needs of our organization and our team members next slide cedric so finally um, the crisis has made us realize the importance of anticipating risks regarding our supply chain um, we realize the benefit of having local suppliers um, where previously we would um, we would often have some of our critical uh, components being made in different parts of the world. So now we're taking a look at um, our sourcing uh, locations and how we can move um, the, the point of production for our, for our supply closer to our operations. Um, I think you're gonna see this trend uh, throughout the industry um, towards more localization. So basically, uh, I guess uh, to, to summarize from, from our standpoint, um, we've realized we've certainly adapted um, our operations and our, and our offices, uh, the way we do business. Um, we're doing a better job. I think we all realize we've adapted better than we ever thought we'd be able to a year ago. And um, we're still learning every day. Every single day in this new way of working, we're learning. And I think what is important is that we all need to continue to take all these lessons learned and what we're learning through this experience and, and make sure that we, we apply it. So it was a crisis we're learning and that we apply this so that we, uh, we are all stronger on the other side um, because uh, we need to come back stronger and, and healthier and, and, and enjoy the uh, the new work environments that uh, that we've created. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Corinne. Thank you. So uh, something uh, I told uh, the panelists uh, as we are reviewing the uh, this presentation uh, early on was how much all those topics are interrelated. 
So we talked about how to manage office space, how to manage travel, how to manage, I would say, the, the support as well as regulation coming from the governing bodies. And, and uh, how do you fit the human element in all of those challenges? So all of those topics are interrelated. So I want to thank all of you uh, for, for being part of this uh, webinar today. Um, I'm going to ask all the panelists to, to put their screen up. Uh, and uh, Lisa, I'm going to turn to you for some questions coming from the audience. Hello, everybody. So actually, uh, our panelists did a great job replying the question during the webinar. So um, participants, guests, I invite you to check uh, the, the chat, the Q&A box, so you can see more details about you know, all the topics we, uh, we saw today. However, there is a question for Corinne from Francis. So since it hasn't been replied yet, uh, I would ask it directly. So uh, Francis is asking, uh, what is the overall psychological impact of remote work on employees? How does it impact communication? So uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, good question. And it's something that, that we are really um, watching closely. Um, it's important that we encourage communication with our teams, uh, with each other, uh, so that we keep connected, so that we understand um, how our employees are doing. Um, while some team members um, absolutely love the remote work and that flexible work environment, um, others feel really disconnected. And that's where it's important, um, as I mentioned on the communication, that that we stay connected, we understand how they're feeling and, and, and Valley has programs to offer, you know, if any team members are struggling um, with any of, uh, any of these social um, issues uh, of, of, of the pandemic, not only in the way of working, but, but with the, with the, the uh, environment overall. Okay. Uh, Francis, you are unmuted now. Uh, does it reply your question? Do you want to hear more detail? Yes, actually, I wanted to have a little bit more detail from Corinne um, as to um, the major issues that you see when you, when you work in remote. Uh, I know that uh, remote, and especially when you are in a uh, remote limit in general, the, the meetings to uh, the team members and does not allow access of information um, to the rest of the team. I mean, there is a portion, I, I believe, and I'm no longer working, I'm retired, but I believe that there is a portion of information that the team members are actually missing. So, so for sure, you know, and that's where the additional communication on the town halls, just to make sure the, I would say the formal messaging is, is done. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, when you're meeting in Zoom, and, and, and believe me, everybody is booked almost back-to-back -back meetings all day. Yes. Um, however, it's very deliberate. So you're scheduling meetings, sometimes 15 minutes. I need to talk to you about this. I need to talk to you about that. What you miss are those follow-up discussions mm -hmm. after a meeting as you're walking out. You know, oh, did we think about this? Um, the, the people that are maybe a little more shy to speak out in a meeting that will kind of corner someone after a meeting and say, hey, I think this would be a good idea. Right. Um, the conversations as you're walking, uh, you know, past each other in the hallway um, that, that aren't deliberate, but you're finding out you're learning um, just by being present. And um, as I mentioned, I think that's missing and that's why um, you know, we're really looking at that hybrid. We need to bring the people together. We need to bring them together to collaborate because that is the element that we're missing. Um, it's that collaboration, it's that um, you know, impromptu um, exchange. It's the mentoring for our new team members, our younger team members who need to learn um, from those others. So. Um, while we're doing everything we can with the, the remote communication, the, you know, the networking opportunities, um, I think um, really as soon as, it, as it's um, that we're able to really encourage people to come back, uh, we will. Okay, thank you. You're Thank welcome. you very much for your question and response. 
Uh, Cedric, do you have to, do we have time? I, I think we are running out of time, but there is another question that is quite interesting. Oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, okay. So it's a question from Gina who asks Corinne, do you think remote work limits the creativity, innovation, capability between OEMs and suppliers? No, that um probably probably a little we're we're pretty amazed at what we're able to do um in terms of you know bringing the teams together virtually uh, i think it was one of our um you know when we first were in lockdown i think we we were challenged thinking oh how are we going to continue these projects we saw some you know we thought some programs may be delayed but we were able to quickly adapt and find that way of working as i mentioned we're doing um, tech shows, we're doing audits, you know, we are able to even even in the really, you know, the really difficult times of the pandemic, when we really um, could not um, encourage people to get face, you know, to be face to face, even for critical um, points, uh, we were able to find ways to keep those program the, the innovation and the programs going, you know, of course, for a short period of time, everyone was short term focused, we were focused on the safety of our teams. So, okay, maybe, maybe there was uh, some, some lost there, but um, I think, again, I think we're adapting quite well in that aspect. Okay. Thank you very much for your response. Cedric, I think, uh, I think we are good uh, regarding the question. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, um, finally, uh, I would like to thank again all our panelists today and i think specifically colliers conlin travel delta medc valeo thank you very much for sharing your insight sharing your view on the the, the aftermath of uh, the covid 19 pandemic uh, what the new future could look like i would like to thank all of those who registered today and i hope that this webinar was valuable to you that you learned something I will conclude uh, with uh, uh, a quick word about the FACC, French American Chamber of Commerce. We rely on you. So if you're happy with what you saw today, if you have not yet renewed your membership, please do so. It's an important part of our funding. And uh, without your membership, we would not be able to offer uh, uh, an event like uh, the one you experienced today uh, free of charge. So thank you again. I'm looking forward to meeting all of you probably again virtually next time. Uh, but for your information, we are looking at resuming live events at some point uh, in May. So uh, stay tuned. And uh, to all of you, I wish you a happy rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.